the nature and meaning of the seven trinities may be suggested as. Now, let's consider this first trinity. This is the personal purposive trinity. This is not the paradise trinity. This is the Father, Son, and Spirit. This is the threefold union of love, mercy, and ministry, the purposive and personal association of the three eternal paradise personalities. This is divinely fraternal, creature-loving, fatherly acting, ascension-promoting association. The members of this first triunity are personality bequeathing, spirit bestowing, and mind endowing gods. This is the triunity of infinite volition. It acts throughout the eternal present and in all of the past, present, future flow of time. This association yields volitional infinity and provides the mechanisms whereby personal deity becomes self-revelatory to the creatures of the evolving cosmos. Why isn't this the Paradise Trinity? Let's turn back to the preceding page. And as we analyze the difference between the first trinity and the Paradise Trinity, you are going to get a feeling for the Paradise Trinity that you never had before. Because up until now, you had been thinking pretty much of the first triunity when you thought of the Trinity concept. It would seem that triunity of absolute relationships is inevitable. Personality seeks other personality association on absolute as well as on all other levels. And the association of the three paradise personalities, they didn't say paradise deities here, eternalizes the first triunity, the personality union of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. For when these three persons, as persons, conjoin for united function, they thereby constitute a triunity of functional unity, not a trinity, an organic entity, but nevertheless a triunity, a threefold functional aggregate unanimity. Let's compare three kinds of association with the Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father bestows personality. That's his personal function. He does this all alone. The Eternal Son bestows Spirit upon the universe. That's his personal function. He does this all alone. The conjoint creator bestows mind upon the universes. He does this all by himself. We are thinking of these three now as individuals. They are not uh, uncooperative. In fact, because they are divine, there is a natural cohesiveness to all of these actions. But you can think of any one of these acts without the other, can't you? The Father may fragment a thought adjuster. This doesn't involve the Son or the Spirit in that act. I think of three people working in three offices, all for the same purpose, but they're performing different functions. One's the, the chief of manufacturing, the chief accountant, the chief of sales. You follow me? Or three teachers teaching three different subjects in three different classrooms. They're all part of the educational system, but they're, they're individual. Now, let's consider three men pulling on a rope. I want to compare that with a triunity. This is an aggregate unanimity. Now, the muscular power of each man augments that of the other two. They've all got their hands on the same rope. This is a much closer association than the three teachers, isn't it? And now, I want you to think of these same three people sitting down as the three directors of a corporation. Now we have a trinity because the corporation is a legal person, an entity. Do you see these three degrees? Now we're, we're talking about here basically 
the difference between the rope, the three men tugging together on the rope, in functional aggregate unanimity in contrast to an organic entity, a trinity. The Paradise Trinity is not a triunity. It is not a functional unanimity. Rather is it undivided and indivisible deity. You see, again, let's consider a tree. I want to have a very funny tree. A Japanese gardener had fun with this tree when it was growing. This tree sprouted three branches, and after they sprouted, the gardener interlaced them and then let them grow. So that we have three levels on this tree. First we have the trunk, where there's just one thing there. Then we have three branches interlaced, and then we have three branches growing out. At the trunk level, we have the trinity. There's only one thing there. At the interlacing level, we have the first triunity. There are three branches, but they're, they're still intertwined. And at the upper level of the tree, we have the three distinctly separate persons of deity. No part of the tree is a contradiction of any other part of the tree. The oneness, unrelated, interrelated, I mean the threeness as unrelated or interassociated, don't contravene oneness. The top of the tree and go down. At the top of the tree we have three branches. This is the Universal Father, the Eternal Son, and the Infinite Spirit. They're not the trinity. No, they're three persons, they're three. Each is a person of deity. You can go to paradise and meet each one of them separately. Yes. Now, as you move down where they're interlaced, this is a triunity relationship. And below that, they are one. And when you deal with the Trinity, you can't find the Father, Son, or Spirit in the Trinity any more than you can find the three branches in the single trunk of the tree. The, the living tree, to me, is the best illustration of this three-in-one paradox. And if you interlace the branches, you get a feeling for a triunity association. The Paradise Trinity is not a triunity. It is not a functional unanimity. Three men tugging on a rope, the intertwined branches. The Paradise Trinity is undivided and indivisible deity, the corporation, the single trunk of the tree. The Father, Son, and Spirit as persons can sustain a relationship to the Paradise Trinity. Any one of these branches can sustain a relationship to the trunk. For the Trinity is their undivided deity. The Father, Son, and Spirit sustain no such personal relationship to the first triunity, for that is their functional union as three persons. You see, <laughs> the deity of the Father is one level, the personality of the Father is another level. When you say Father, Son, and Spirit as deity, you can't. That is Trinity. You're down at the trunk of the tree. Only as the Trinity, as undivided deity, do they collectively sustain an external relationship to the triunity of their personal aggregation. If the Father, Son, and Spirit want to sustain a relationship to the first triunity and do this collectively, they can do this only as the Paradise Trinity. Thus does the Paradise Trinity stand unique among absolute relationships. There are several existential triunities, but only one existential trinity. A triunity is not an entity. It is functional 
rather than organic. And I can't improve on our comparison. The interlacing of the branches versus the singleness of the trunk. There isn't any interlacing in the trunk. It is one. Its members are partners rather than cooperative. That's a good way of putting it. A three guys uh, cooperate. That's one thing. Three guys form a partnership. That's something yet again. Three guys organize a corporation. And now for the first time, we have a fourth entity there. The corporation has legal standing. The partnership doesn't have too much standing in the eyes of the law. There is, however, no, its members are partners rather than corporate. The components of the triunities may be entities, but a triunity itself is an association. There is, however, one point of comparison between trinity and triunity. <coughs> Both eventuate in functions. Now, they're using the word eventuate there in a loose sense. I think you could say both result in functions that are something other than the discernible sum of the attributes of the component partners. But while they are thus comparable from a functional standpoint, they otherwise exhibit no categorical relationship. They are roughly related as the relation of function to structure. But the function of the triunity association is not the function of the trinity structure or entity. The triunities are nonetheless real. They're very real. In them is total reality functionalized. And through them does the Universal Father exercise immediate and personal control over the master functions of infinity. Now, let's go back and take a look. We now can, on the next page, 1148, we now have a better feeling for this first triunity, don't we? And we know it's not the Trinity. We know the Trinity can sustain a relationship to it. And we now have a better feeling for the word Trinity whenever they use it in these papers. The Trinity is an organic reality. And its personal members can sustain a personal relationship to the Trinity of which they are a part. And now maybe you can understand the first experiential Trinity better. The first experiential trinity has a lot of people in it. It's got uh, one supreme being. It's got over 20,000 architects of the master universe. It's got, <laughs> with the creator sons and creative spirits, alone you've got a million and a half nearly, a million four hundred thousand, plus 21 ancients of days, plus seven master spirits. This is a deity union in the first experiential trinity, not a personal presence in the first experiential trinity. What? I never realized that. You can't until you get into this discussion. If you want to symbolize, conceptualize that trinity better, uh, you, you can distort it and say, let's say we'll have the supreme being, the senior architect of the master universe, and the seventh master spirit, you know? Uh, you can symbolize it, but it's much more complex. These creator sons can be out on the first outer space level and sustain a personal relationship to the first experiential trinity of which, as deity, they are structurally built in. But I'm, I'm merely trying to discuss trinity in general. There are three, there are four possible trinities. Three trinities and then a big one made up of these three. The trinity of trinities. And this is a structural reality, an organic unity. Here, in the first experiential trinity, we start out with the trunk of a tree. But this trinity has got many thousands of branches, not three. 
But we still have a trunk. And these branches may be a long ways away from where the trunk is. Let's consider the second triunity. The power pattern triunity. Whether it be a tiny automaton, a blazing star, a whirling nebula, even the central or super universes, from the smallest to the largest material organizations, always is the physical pattern, the cosmic configuration derived from the function of this triunity. The first member intrigues me. It's the Father-Son. There's a lot in here that isn't very understandable. We're going to discuss eight, seven triunities and just to mess you up, at the end of their discussion they say these approximations are sufficient to elucidate the concept of the triunities. Not knowing the ultimate level of the triunities, you cannot fully comprehend the first seven. <laughs> While we do not deem it wise to attempt any further elaboration, we may state that there are 15 triune associations of the first source and center, eight of which are unrevealed in these papers. These unrevealed associations are concerned with realities, actualities, and potentialities which are beyond the experiential level of supremacy. Here. The triunities are the functional balance wheel of infinity, the unification of the uniqueness of the seven infinity absolutes. It is the existential presence of the triunities that enables the Father I am to experience functional infinity unity despite the diversification of infinity into seven absolutes. The first source and center is the unifying member of all triunities. In him, all things have their unqualified beginnings, eternal existences, and infinite destinies. Although these associations cannot augment the infinity of the Father I Am, they do appear to make possible the sub-infinite and sub-absolute manifestations of his reality. The seven triunities multiply versatility eternalize new depths, deitize new values, disclose new potentialities, reveal new meanings, and all these diversified manifestations in time and space and in the eternal cosmos are existent in the hypothetical stasis of the original infinity of the I Am. We're dealing with, with levels here, see? Again, stack these frames up like pancakes. Let's go back to the second triunity. If we read the end, we understand the middle better. This is the Father, Son, the Paradise Isle, and the Conjoint Actor. And this is the group that started creation going. Energy is organized by the cosmic agents of the third source and center. Energy is fashioned after the pattern of paradise, the absolute materialization. But behind all of this ceaseless manipulation is the presence of the Father's Son, whose union first activated the paradise pattern in the appearance of Havona, concomitant with the birth of the infinite spirit, the conjoint actor. You see, what they did back there in eternity, when the God of action functioned and the dead vaults of space were astir, they're still doing. This, you should not say this did happen, you should say this is happening. It's happening just as much today as it happened then. It never stopped happening. In religious experience, creatures make contact with the God who is loved, but such spiritual insight must never eclipse the intelligent recognition of the universe fact of the pattern which is paradise. God is spirit, but paradise is not. The paradise personalities enlist the free will adoration of all creatures by the compelling power of divine love and lead all such spirit-born personalities into the supernal delights of the unending service of the finaliter sons of God. The second triunity is the architect of the space stage 
whereon these transactions unfold. It determines the patterns of cosmic configuration. Love may characterize the divinity of the first triunity, but pattern is the galactic manifestation of the second triunity. What the first triunity is to evolving personalities, the second triunity is to the evolving universes. Pattern and personality are two of the great manifestations of the acts of the first source and center. And no matter how difficult it may be to comprehend, it is nonetheless true that the power pattern and the loving person are one and the same universe reality. The Paradise Isle and the Eternal Sun are coordinate but antipodal revelations of the unfathomable nature of the universal Father Force. We're stretching your imagination here. See, we're still studying the first source and center. And it's in these relationships, through these relationships, we can get a better feeling of the fact that our philosophic postulate of the first source and center must exceed our worshipful concept of the universal father. The third triunity, the spirit evolutional triunity, this, the entirety of spiritual manifestation has its beginning and end in this association consisting of, one, the universal father, two, the sun spirit. Isn't that interesting? Three, the deity absolute. From spirit potency to paradise spirit, all spirit finds reality expression in this triune association of the pure spirit essence of the Father, the active spirit values of the Son Spirit, and the unlimited spirit potentials of the Deity Absolute. The existential values of spirit have their primordial genesis, complete manifestation, and final destiny in this triunity. The Father exists before spirit, the Son Spirit functions as active creative spirit. The Deity Absolute exists as all-encompassing spirit, even beyond spirit. This is where they get seraphim from when they create them. This is where supernophim came from when they were created. Primaries. This is where it's on, it's on this relationship that the Master Spirits draw. When today, they create secondary supernatural. The fourth triunity. I never forget the first time I read this. I thought, they, they, they got to run out. They can't keep having these, see? What do they do? The triunity of energy infinity. No. Love and volition. Power and pattern. Spirit, now energy. Within this triunity, there eternalizes the beginnings and the endings of all energy reality from space potency to Minota. This group embraces the following. One, the Father Spirit. Two, the Paradise Isle. Three, the unqualified absolute. Paradise is the center of the force energy activation of the cosmos, the universe position of the first source and center, the cosmic focal point of the unqualified absolute, and the source of all energy. Existentially present within this triunity is the energy potential of the cosmos infinite of which the grand universe and the master universe are only partial manifestations. There it is. There it is, cold turkey. The fourth triunity absolutely controls the fundamental units of cosmic energy and releases them from the grasp of the unqualified absolute in direct proportion to the appearance of the ex in the experiential deities of sub-absolute capacity to control and stabilizing 
the metamorphosing cosmos. This triunity is force and energy. The endless possibilities of the unqualified absolute are centered around the absolutum, the stuff of the Isle of Paradise, whence emanate the unimaginable agitations of the otherwise static quiet quiescence of the unqualified and the endless throbbing of the material paradise heart of the infinite cosmos beats in harmony with the unfathomable pattern and the unsearchable plan of the infinite energizer the first source and center this whole thing is alive and paradise is the heart that beats that pulsates let's turn to page 469 where they discuss what goes on with this trinity <coughs> here is the discussion of universal non-spiritual energy systems physical energies This discussion starts out with a discussion of the conversion of potentials into actuals and ends with a discussion of actuals that exist from eternity. We start out with space potency. This is what came from paradise and passed into the, un, into the control of the unqualified absolute. I think of paradise as the pitcher the unqualified absolute as the catcher, and the baseball was the uncreated stuff of the unbegun universes of the eternal future. And ever since then, they've been unraveling that baseball. Do you follow me? It came from paradise, but paradise made that bestowal just once, and he made it without limit. And since the unqualified absolute is limitless, he could catch an infinite baseball. I'll never unwind it completely. No. Space potency is the beginning of energy as we view it. And it's spoken of as absoluta. And that is the neuter form in Latin of which absolutum is the masculine form. And I think they picked those words designedly. Absolutum is the stuff of paradise. Absoluta is that which came from paradise and which is the ultimate ancestor of all matter. Now, as we read this from space potency down to universe power, as we go through the first four stages here, but not beyond that, I want you to visualize the crystallization of water vapor. I want you to stop and think how this room is filled with invisible water vapor. And as this water vapor emerges to the recognition of our sensory mechanism, our eyes, first of all, it fogs a little then a real cloud forms. This is distinct. These clouds look so darn real, it looks almost like you could sit on one, you know, in contrast to the blue sky. This, these clouds didn't come from nothing, though, did they? That water vapor was there all the time. And then, let's go on and let water rain out of this cloud. It's getting more tangible, isn't it? And then let the water freeze. And now we got something we can wrap. This is very real in contrast to the seeming unreality of invisible water vapor to our senses. The next step is primordial force. Now, primordial force is something that is still water vapor. It still wouldn't register but in some way it's different from space potency. 
it is something, you know, primordial force emerges from space potency, not because of anything which the force organizers do, but simply because they go out there. It's probably happened already. It's probably a function of this fourth triunity. It's probably a function of the conjoint actor, the infinite manipulator. They speak of it as segregata. I think that word suggests, should suggest to us that here is something which has been segregated from something which is not qualified. This is a chunk now, apart from the whole. As we turn the page, we discover that we're going to talk about two levels of emergent energy, emerging from invisibility to visibility. Here is where fog appears and the cloud gets very real and solid looking. Emergent energy goes through two phases. The primary master force organizers now go to work. They really go to work. What's happened before is a little hard, is a little difficult to say that they did it. Let's say they consummated something which perhaps the third source and center did. But now they take over. They operate on the less visible, more tenuous side of emergent energy. They produce puissant energy. Puissant is a good English word, meaning powerful. Yon puissant prince, says Shakespeare. And here we have direction. Clockwise, counterclockwise motion would be indigenous to puissant energy. And here for the first time Paradise gravity begins to reach out in a tenuous way. Now, this was the condition of affairs. In fact, this 3A stage was pretty well completed when they begin the story of the Andronover Nebula. Because it was an associate master force organizer who came out into these regions and discovered that things looked right for materialization. His senior colleagues, the primary force organizers, hadn't told him anything. He had to find this. And it was the Aversa Council of Equilibrium, made up of associate force organizers and power directors which issued the permit authorizing him to come out here and initiate the Andronover Nebula. But everything we've read here up until now had already gone on before. As it says on page 651, just before they used their first date, of 987 billion years ago when this associate force organizer discovered the situation. The preceding sentence reads, at the time of the beginning of this recital, the primary master force organizers of paradise had long been in full control of the space energies which were later organized as the Andronover Nebula. They never tell us how long they've been there. They tell us when the associate force organizers took over. These associate force organizers then go to work, and now it's beginning to rain. Now we're getting something pretty tangible, because we not only have paradise gravity beginning to operate, but local gravity is beginning to operate. 
In the case of Andronover, they worked for about 100 billion years. And then they stepped aside and the power directors of Orvantan took over when we pass from stage three to stage four. In outer space, there are no power directors available. And so these associate force organizers would continue right on fostering the further development of the suns and star systems of the outer space levels. This this level of the active function of the primary force organizers, starting with clouds and ending with rain, is spoken of as ultimata. And this is the energy domain of the emerging ultimate, God the ultimate. We are now on the second floor of the firehouse. God the ultimate has to do with power. If I were to christen the power phase of the ultimate, I would refer to it as the omnipotent, a term analogous to the almighty in relation to the supreme. That is a new idea. Yes. You see, you've come down from the control of the unqualified absolute as absoluta to segregata, where the god of action is involved. And if any compensating motion is involved, the universal absolute's involved. Then to this level of the active function of the primary force organizers and the active function of the secondary force organizers. This is the transcendental level. The architects of the master universe are directing these people. This is the level, this is the second floor of the firehouse. Absoluta is on the third floor of the firehouse. Segregata is either at the floor of the third floor or at the ceiling of the middle floor. I don't know which. But ultimata is down on the second floor floor, the middle floor. And now we come down into the bottom floor of the firehouse. Universe power. This is the energy domain of the supreme. And it's spoken of as gravita. Because it responds to linear gravity, I think. Now we've got ice. This is very tangible. Now we've got everything that we know about in the domain of physics. We now have electricity, we have magnetism, we have chemism, we have elements, isotopes, and whatnot. As these papers describe things, we may get up into the lower levels of gravity energy. Because, by, what? By we, you mean... Our uh, physicists. Yes. Like yes. Your right. Now, this is the end of the story as far as the evolution of energy and matter is concerned in time and space. The rest of this story concerns a tracing back of the trail through eternity. Because the next energy we talk about is triata. This is the material stuff of the one billion Havona worlds. Space potency went into outer space. We've been considering how it is released down. And now, instead of dealing with the transactions of the extra Havona space levels, yeah. right, and outer, yeah. we're now going into Havona, and we're going to examine how the rest of the story of energy, but this has nothing to do with space potency, I don't think. Well, here's a question. Let me ask you something. When Paradise produced the material of Havona, did it technically go through space potency to become Havona, or did it come out direct? I don't know. It's not important. 
you could you could debate that one either way. In a sense, we're looking at a at a big curve like this. We started with absoluta, and it got less and less absolute as we brought it down. And now, as we retrace our way into paradise, we're going to see this swing back toward something absolute again. Triata, pardon go ahead. Space potency had to do with evolutionary development only? Yes, I think so. I think so. Space potency is concerned with any materialization in the super universes or the outer space levels. Well, then Havona. Havona is well, eternal. It have come through it. I doubt that it would, yes. Whether it did or not is beside the point. What gravita is out here, triata is, in Havona. Gravita discusses our physical realities, all those which are known to us. And our mass materialization is twofold. Our atoms have two charges, positive and negative. In Havona, they have three charges, positive, negative, and something else. Matter has different properties in Havona than it has out here. It's not this kind of matter, but it's physical. For one thing, they use worlds in Havona that would be asinine out here because of too much gravity. But you can have enormously massy worlds in Havona, and it doesn't build up to that much gravity. It builds up to gravity, but not that much. I'm not at all certain that a Havona world isn't a heck of a lot larger than the sphere Jupiter. And on Jupiter, the gravity pull would squish us flat. We would just spread out uh, on Bud's floor here like maple syrup. In fact, we'd seek the cracks. That's how strong the pull would be. We'd just liquefy on Jupiter. <coughs> now, this is the existential or eternal energy domain of the conjoint actor functioning in behalf of the Paradise Trinity of own energy. There's still another form of energy. It operates on and from the upper level of Paradise and only in connection with the Absinite peoples. They call it Trinosta. They don't say whose energy domain it is. You see, now we've gotten to something super finite. This is transcendental energy. It's on the second or third floor of the firehouse. It's the second. And now we're going to the third floor of the firehouse, right where we started out. When we deal with the energy of paradise itself, called Minota. We measure energy down here with ammeters and voltmeters. And let's say that you could have a universal ammeter volt voltmeter, which you could use on paradise. And you could clamp this ammeter voltmeter onto the eternal sun and measure paradise spirit and get a reading. Then you could clamp this onto the stuff of paradise and take a reading on Minota and you would get exactly the same readings because on paradise the physical energy of the eternal isle and the spiritual energy of the eternal sun are just plain exactly the same. And the only way you can tell one from the other is to recognize the source of the energy. And if it comes from the eternal sun, you say this is paradise spirit. And if it comes from the eternal isle, you say this is paradise manota. And the only way you distinguish them is by name. Let's illuminate this.
in the papers of the first source and center as such. They're not talking about the universal father. Here we take inventory for the first time in these papers of the seven absolutes of infinity. Father, Son, Spirit, Paradise, Deity, Universal, and Unqualified Absolute. The first source and center is original reality. The next three are actual reality. The last three are potential reality. God